people were like, oh, what's the story? So I just was like, well, I guess I'll start telling it. So I started telling the story um, from start to finish. And then um, overnight, one night, randomly, I went from 12,000 followers to 800,000 in the matter of 24 hours. Uh, Something picked up and it was like six months later. So I... Wow. Was shocked, and then suddenly it was everywhere. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial in Richland County history. Dr. John Boyle is accused of killing his wife, Noreen, and burying her body in the basement of his new home in Erie, Pennsylvania. The 12-year-old son finally took the stand. As I heard a scream, I heard a thud. It was about this loud. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. When I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. This podcast serves as a type of therapy and reconciliation for myself, and it is my hope that it helps anyone who has experienced deception, betrayal, and dark trauma. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Hey, movers, welcome back to another episode of Moving Past Murder. I'm your host, Collier Landry, and what's going on? What's going on, everybody? Happy Friday. Thank you for listening, tuning in again. Uh, We have a great episode in store for you today because this is part two of my episode interview with Brooke Nicole, who I discovered on TikTok. And speaking of TikTok, um, thank you all of my supporters on TikTok that have discovered me here on the podcast. You guys are listening, you are downloading, you are subscribing to my YouTube channel. And if you've not subscribed, please, you are watching this on YouTube, click like and subscribe. It helps with the algorithm. I also want to give a big shout out to those of you that are supporting me on Patreon. I have a new Patreon supporter today. Uh, Her name is Seesaw, Nicole Garcia. Thank you so much for supporting the program, the podcast. Every little bit helps. Thank you so much. Um, Most of it goes towards coffee that keeps me up to do the podcast in the first place. (laughs) Um, uh, Anyways, um, yeah, thank you all so much. Seriously, um, you know, uh, I'm building this thing. It is a labor of love and um, I appreciate all your support. Every single download helps. Every single subscription helps. Every single pledge or support helps really does. I cannot thank you all enough. So enough of that. I want to get to this week's listener question and actually, well, actually listener comment. And um, this one has kind of made me smile because this is from Chanel Brown on YouTube. And she says, I love the sound of your voice too. We have something in common. When I need to relax, I put you on the uh, on and within three to five minutes, I am fully relaxed. Hopefully not fully asleep relax we like (laughs) which is a big thing it normally takes me ages because anxiety and thoughts but i focus on you and what you're talking about and it also can be a mission because again thoughts and other things and what i'm trying to say so okay chanel thank you so much for writing thank you for commenting on my voice because sometimes i make jokes about how i love the sound of my own voice so obviously this was what she is alluding to um thank you very much i appreciate your cheeky humor If no one else does, I do. Um, So I have a great episode for you guys. This is part two of my interview with Brooke Nicole. If you guys listened last week, um, you heard her sort of unfold her story uh, about how she heard the murder of her mother happen. It was her father had said her mother committed suicide. Then it was, uh, she got hit by a car. Then it was some other story. And then, you know, you guys have seen a lot of parallels being drawn as Brooke and I talk, uh, between my father and his narcissistic and sociopathic behavior and her own father, which is an unfortunate club to be a part of for sure. 100%. You do not want to be a member of this club or anything like that. Um, it, uh, yeah, it's really unfortunate, but look, she has taken to social media and TikTok, especially to get her story out there, to raise awareness for domestic violence and to also help bring justice for her mother. And, um, it's really, really cool, uh, to see that. Unfortunately, some members of her family are like, why can't you just walk away from this? And why are you making a big stink? And you know, that is to be expected. I had the same reactions from my own family and I still do actually, 
why do you keep talking about this? Why do you bring it up? Well, hey, guess what? This is my life. This was the hand I was dealt. And these are the cards that I'm going to play. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think I'm doing the best I can. And um, I'm, uh, I'm happy with myself. So that's really all that matters. Um, I, so I really commend Brooke on, on what she's doing. Uh, it's really, really cool to meet another kindred spirit, uh, unfortunately, on those terms. But, hey... It is what it is. <laughs> uh, we do the best we can. Like I said, you play the hand, you're dealt. And um, that is something that I have, uh, it's taken me a long time to do, but um, you know, it kind of, it started to really culminate in me um, making a murder in Mansfield, my film, uh, when I return to my small town and confront, uh, you know, it, it, look at the impacts of, of the murder and the consequences of violence on my small town community and those that were involved in the murder uh, indirectly, obviously. Uh, but, you know, the ancillary victims exploring, exploring subjects like non-combat PTSD, things of like that. And then my personal journey to sort of, to not sort of, to get an answer from my father on why he killed my mother. And if you watch the film, you see the big confrontation scene, or I guess, I don't know if it was a confrontation or not, but it was a big scene with me, uh, facing my father in prison to talk to him about the murder and, um, see what he had to say about it <laughs> to say the least. Um, if you haven't checked it out, it is on, um, investigation discovery or discovery plus now it was on Hulu. It is called a murder in Mansfield. Um, that was probably the thing that started to really galvanize my approach to doing something like a podcast, um, which is where I, you know, obviously am relating every week to you guys, not only my personal story of, uh, what happened with my mother and, uh, you know, reading the letters from prison from my father, for you guys as my audience, uh, seems to be not only cathartic for myself, but also cathartic for you guys, the listeners and always every single week. I appreciate all of your input that you guys give me because it helps me develop material and podcasts that are beneficial to you guys, my audience. So I thank you for that, for reaching out, for all your comments. Thank you so much. Um, on that note, I want to get into part two of my interview with Brooke Nicole, B Nicole 324 on TikTok uh, is her handle. And um, yeah, let's get into the second part of our interview with Brooke Nicole. So here you've lived through this your entire life. Yes. Uh, you're obviously, obviously a functioning adult. And then you discover TikTok. Oh, yeah. How did, and, and you, so, so talk to me about that. What, so you found a platform where you could start to be an advocate for your mother. Was that your intent with pursuing all of this? Uh, yes and no. Um, I always wanted to find some sort of platform to do something about it, but, um, the way I always saw it was I need to be older and um, I need to get through college. I need to have an established job because I always said, if I have a mental breakdown over this, I don't know how I'm going to react. You know, I don't know if I'm going to learn all these new things about it and just break down or I might be fine, but I don't want to risk college over that. I don't want to risk a career over that. I need to be stable. So um, that's the first thing I did was get through all of that. And then once I was stable, I'd like bought a house. I have a career, like graduated college, all that. I was like, okay, now I need to do something about it. I need to start talking. And the only way to really do the research and start talking and start talking to people, because I, a lot of the people that like the investigators and stuff, they're starting to die or retire or, you know, it's all from 25 years ago. So I was like, I am kind of on a timeline. Um, but I also had to do it when it was okay with me. But then TikTok happened and the pandemic happened and I'm like scrolling through TikTok and there's this like funny trend. And I had this idea for a super morbid joke, TikTok. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is not gonna go well for my family. They're gonna hate this. And I, d I did it uh, just to be funny. And my cousins were like laughing at me, who I'm really close to. Um, they were like, ah, that's funny, you know, but you have to know my sense of humor, which dead parent humor can be like a whole like side thing that people don't <laughs> understand, you know? So. Oh, and people get upset yeah, and people were like, how can you yeah. joke about this? And I'm like, well, how, like, what am I, what would you yeah. like me to do? Crawl under a rock? And I was like, live, this is my reality. You know? And you know, it is what it is. And I was like, I think my mom would find it funny. So there we go. 
Yeah, my mother had a sardonic yeah, sense so of humor, like, so I'm like, I'm like, I yeah, should love like, this. It's so, fine. Don't, don't worry about worry. it. Like, um, so I made the show TikTok. It like quote unquote blew up. Like I didn't know what it, it blew up for me, who had like three followers. Suddenly, I had like twelve thousand, um, and people were like, "Oh, what's the story?" So I just was like, "Well." I guess I'll start telling it. So I started telling the story um, from start to finish. And then um, overnight, one night, randomly, I went from 12,000 followers to 800,000 in the matter of 24 hours. Uh, Something picked up and it was like six months later. So I was shocked. And then suddenly it was everywhere. And it, it, that came out of nowhere. So like, Yes, I did mean to like use TikTok, but not really. <laughs> like, I, I thought that I was going to end up having to like write a book or something eventually. Like I was like, what way can I like put this story out there where people will pay attention? Like I'd written letters to law enforcement for years. Nobody paid attention. Nobody got back to me. No one responded. Like, you know, I was ignored for at least five years before TikTok by everyone who I thought mattered. I mean, I wrote state representatives. I wrote everybody I could think of and nobody responded to me. So I was like, well, I'm not really a YouTuber. Like that's not my thing. Um, Sure. And so, yeah, I TikTok kind of, I fell into it on accident because I had a morbid idea (laughs) for a morbid joke. Oh yeah, me too. Me too. I was was like, (laughs) well, this is way easier than writing a book. I could just talk, like talk to a camera and yeah the fact that people pay attention to it never really occurred to me and then it happened so yeah overnight that's what it jumped (laughs) so something that i find really interesting (laughs) and i don't know if this is a trauma survivor thing or what but you spoke about you're going to tell this story you're going to do something about this but you need to be in a certain position to do it like you have this whole list of Mm -hmm. goals much like myself of like okay look you know my father did go to prison Mm -hmm. i did put my father in prison and all that happened but still for me that's not where the story ended it's really kind of where it began Mm -hmm. for me right and i was like okay so i'm going to get out of my small town i'm going to pursue a career in the arts i'm going to either like i and i've told people ad nauseum but it basically was like i'm either going to you know i went to music school so i was like i'm either going to become a rock star and be you know be a rock star become famous and then tell my story and help people or i'm going to become a filmmaker and tell my right. story and help people like it's it's one of those mm-hmm. two things that's going to happen and i end up being a filmmaker mm-hmm. right and um it's it, it's it, it but it all had this very calculated timeline to it and granted like probably the one thing is choosing a life of an artist wasn't like you choose financial stability of course but what i did do is i wanted to be you know people kept saying to me well when you're in the scene with your father in prison is that the first like is that the first time you saw him i'm like no i had a relationship with my father for 25 years you know all of that was was leading up to my father um you, to, to confronting my father in prison because I was teeing all of this up, getting to know him, you, you know, and, and with this desire to tell my story. And my father actually thought that I was making a film to help him get out of prison because that's what narcissists do, right? Oh, yeah. And he thought it was all about, and of course, it's all about him, right? And that's, um, but, it, but it was, again, this very methodical, calculated, like, on my time, when I will deal with this, this is step one, step two, step three, step four. And I wonder... And this is why all that to say this, do you feel like having that calculated sort of systematic approach to it where you're almost compartmentalizing, if that is a trauma response, do you feel that? Oh, I know it is. I know it is because I, um, in therapy, I talk my my therapist and I talk about this all the time because, um, I, she says I'm extremely high functioning, but I have an extremely high standards for myself. Um, I will literally schedule and like plot out everything, free time, everything. Like I'm going to watch this many episodes of this show and then I'm going to read this many chapters of this book. And like, I do that on the daily. I make lists, I do that. So I know that that's always been so that I can check things off and 
um, so I can have some control over my environment. Like that's what it is. It's a sure. coping mechanism 100%. to have control over your environment because you come from a place of chaos and instability. And it is the way that I can organize my own chaos. So I do this every day of my life. So even for big things, for little things, um, I need to be able to not do that sometimes um, because I have a lot of trouble relaxing sure, even course. in my free time or things that are supposed to be relaxing. I turn them into goal oriented things. Um, so like I can't just read a book. I have to read this many books in this amount of time. So, you know, like it's, it's horrible, but it is how I function. It's so familiar. Yeah, it's it so is, familiar it is, though. It's, it's like literally it's just... to control your environment and to control your surroundings. And it's, you know, people are like, well, you control the things you can. Well, these are the things I can control. So, um, yeah, I had to have that list of goals because I was convinced that if I didn't go to college and get a degree first, or if I, you know, I would focus so much on this. And if I didn't have that to back me up, I would never go. I would never go back. I would never, you know, and I, I wanted to make sure that I set myself up to like, be in a position to live a life that he didn't get to dictate that like I dictated for yeah. myself. Like I was like, I want these things for myself. So I need to make sure that they happen first. And then because whatever he's done in the past is going to send me for like an emotional roller coaster later, but I need to make sure I, I don't want to lose the potential for these things. I want to make sure I have them first before I let that happen. So it is definitely a coping mechanism, but it has always been how I functioned like my whole life. So um, even like I was super into movies and film and, um, and theater in high school, I could, I would like literally pick like a director or an actor or something and watch their entire filmography and I would check it off on a list like things like that like that I've always done that <laughs> like so you, you know it, it's, it works but it's <laughs> so like I can relate so much to this now I can't relate to the like putting my scheduling myself down to the mo minute of the day with with certain things like even remedial tasks like going to the grocery store or whatever but when you were telling it to me i was like god that sounds great i, know. I was i was very <laughs> energized by that i wasn't like that sounds nuts i was like that sounds that sounds amazing like what call you need to step up your yeah. game get yeah. a little more organized with your day because i'm always because it's so funny like you see the guitars behind yeah. me i went to music school people are like you know, you talk about high standards, right? And people are like, oh, you know, can you, you play guitar? I'm like, hey, I'm, 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 I'm mm -hmm. not that good or whatever. And then I realized that like, I have friends that are professional musicians right. that are famous, right? And that's what I'm in my head with my trauma. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but I can't play like X right. person. And they're like, well, yeah, but not many people yeah, can. Yeah. Like, you understand that? But like, that's the yeah. these ridiculously high standards. So then I'm like, well, I just really won't, I won't play for you or whatever. And they're like, oh, you're great. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not this person. Like, but, yeah, but I like, again, yeah. you just do these, you do, and, I, and, I, and again, I, so I'm wondering, like, you just answered my question, which is, is that a trauma response? These setting these really very high mm -hmm. standards in a way that like, we, like it makes us feel comfortable because it, it feels probably to the outsider they're going or to our therapist <laughs> yeah. for sure. I'm sorry, are going like, these are such unrealistic expectations yes, yes. for you that you're never going to achieve it. And you're, but we justify in our minds that like, look, I made a film about my life with a two time Oscar mm -hmm. winner about my life. And it was not somebody right. didn't approach me. I was the one that initiated all this and found all the people and put everything together. It's, it's one of those things, but like, that is like when I stop and think about it, if I if somebody was telling me that story, it was not me, and they were telling me right. my story, I'd be like, "That's fucking mm -hmm. insane." You understand how insane right. that is. But then with myself, I look at it and I go, "Well, yeah, what else was yeah, I going to do?" Yeah, exactly. Like, like that's just my mind, it, it, and people are just like, "But you understand how bizarre yeah. that is, <laughs> right?" And I'm like, "No, but it's not yeah. bizarre. But it really probably is. It's just for us, we just have this like sort of like, and and these high standards give us something to like." really look forward mm -hmm. to or, or, or to, to move towards because it, we feel like we're going to regress, right? I think that's a trauma response is like, oh, we're going to regress into this feeling of abandonment or whatever. So if we have these things and, and I, and I think that it's great professionally, I don't know if it's great in like terms of relationships, oh, that's a whole other <laughs> like, <thing. laughs> like romantic <laughs> relationship. And I'm going to say, that's where I was yeah, going to go with. That's 
because my dating life is like a is like a oh, dumpster fire. Oh, yeah. Literally, oh, it's yeah. a constant dumpster People are always fire. Like, don't you have issues? Because like they can't see my outward. Like outwardly, I don't project any like really messed up issues that you might expect to see with someone with my story. Like stereotypically, um, and I'm like, yeah, but you should see me try to talk to men. Like it's a whole other thing. Like how I deal with relationships is completely different. Like. I have so many issues surrounding that, but that's where 90% of my issues live because it's a dumpster fire. Yeah. <laughs> but well, because it's, but, it, but it's, it's also like this, this weird thing because they, they, I feel like you come into a situation there and it's this mutual attraction where they don't know all this stuff right. about you. And then, and I feel like a lot of it is like, I'm very upfront, especially now. Like I wasn't for years. I mean, I was upfront, but I wasn't like, here's the whole story. But now because the whole story is out there, I'm like, just, oh, you don't know who I am. Just Google, not to sound like a dick, but just Google me just in case if you want to continue to talk to me because I'm very public and I have this very public story and I don't want there to be any surprises because that sounds like a little, you know, solipsistic when you say that to someone and I have to like put this caveat on it, but I'm like, this is just, I know this sounds like, cause they're like, oh yeah, Google you for what? And then they're like, oh my yeah. God. Like, they, oh, oh, I thought you were just like, you were some whatever and you were just trying to show off. And I'm like, no, no, no. Trying to give you a heads up before you even go down this road. And it's like this weird sort of thing, but I feel like, and part of it is we're dealing with stuff that we bring to the relationship. Like every, every person that's been in relationships has baggage, but also then they sort of take this baggage that we've, and they project it on themselves. Like, Oh my God, how am I dealing with this person right. that's been through this? Like my day, like, it, like I was watching this comic named Whitney her. Cummings. I don't really know what her story is. Yeah. I love Whitney Cummings, by the way, dumbest moment in my life. You talk about talking to women. I met her once and we're talking and literally the, the blah, 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 that came out of my mouth was like, you are absolutely stunning <laughs> in real life. Like, I, I go, yeah. cause she, she was yeah. stunning to me. Dark hair, piercing mm -hmm. blue eyes. Just, I'm just like, uh, I met her at the gym. I was like, uh, and she's like, yeah, that's always tough to hear. And then literally like was dismissed as quickly as she said uh. hi to me. And I was just, but it, it was like this. And I'm thinking to myself, like oh, this dribble comes out of my mouth. Anyways, she was talking about this. She was engaged to this guy and he was saying, talking about his trauma and his trauma was he remembers when he, he, uh, saw his dad putting the Christmas presents out. And then he, and what was traumatic about that is, is he discovered there was no Santa Claus. That was his big trauma. And she was, and we should, this is yeah, a routine, yeah, so it yeah. could be a total joke, but it's interesting. Like the, the normies, if yeah. you call them, if you're an AA or whatever they call them, the normies, you know, the normies that, that are just like, oh yeah, my big trauma is like, that's what happened to my life. And it's like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I, I, I discovered there was no Santa Claus because after my mother was murdered, yeah. I was cleaning out her house and I discovered all the letters from Santa Claus and asked the person I was with, why does mommy have all the letters uh, from Santa Claus? And she goes, what, you didn't know that Santa Claus is fake? Like there's no Santa Claus. And I, and I didn't know that there was no Santa Claus. It was actually the one thing of my childhood no, I was still holding on to no. at that point. But that's how I found out there was oh, no that's Santa Claus. And I'm like, so that was a traumatic <laughs> thing. That was like, okay, so my mother's been murdered. My father's been arrested. And, and, and now there's no, there's no fucking Claus. Santa Claus. That's, all in the span of like fantastic. 30 days. Thank you. Great. Uh, love that. Great. Love that. Thanks. No, I, um, I used to not tell, like I covered my face for part of what you were talking about. Cause it was crazy. I used to not tell anybody, uh, that I was dating right away. Like I just, I was just kind of aloof about it until I got to know them better because I didn't want them to be like, oh, that's too much. And like run away because I, it's seemingly a lot of red flags right away, you know? Um, and I'm like, okay, I don't want them to like, they want them to judge me for me, not for something that happened to me as a kid. So I want them to know me first. So I used to kind of, when I was younger, hide it a little bit um, until it came out. Like I, I, they'd be like, oh, where are your parents? I'd be like, oh, I don't really have them. Like, uh, we'll talk about it later. Like I was never, like I wasn't, I never lied. I just never fully told the truth until I got to know them for a couple months. And then- Sure, that's not lying. I understand yeah. people saying, well, you're not telling the truth, but like, yeah, not telling you the it's truth not, of like you're you're well they think you're 35 and you're really 44. Well, that's that's sort of deceptive. That's different. Not wanting to tell them that your father murdered your mother and you yeah. witnessed it and like or whatever yeah. it is like that you don't really have to volunteer that. That's not lying because you didn't first tell them. Date material. Um, <laughs> no. like, so I'm like I want to like make sure I'm serious about this person before I like tell them you know 
everything and like I can trust them because it was harder for me to tell details back in the day and stuff so I did um I would wait but now that's not really an option because like I get recognized everywhere you're TikTok famous yeah and so I'm like oh people are like I was in the McDonald's drive-thru and somebody was like you're that girl from TikTok whose mom died and I'm like I just really want a Diet Coke. Like, that's all I want in my life is a Diet Coke. Like, why? Okay, thank you. I appreciate you. Like, I, no, don't get me wrong. Like, people can come up to me. I don't mind that at all. And I get that everyone wants to talk about it. I put it out there. But um, dating, it has made things a little different. Like, um, because I have to be like, on my profile, it says, if you see me on TikTok, no, you didn't. Like, that's, yeah, if if you saw me on TikTok, no, you didn't. Like, you did not. Ghost stories are always scarier when they're told by the very people who experienced them. Hi, I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. And we're the hosts of the Homespun Haints podcast. We talk to people just like you who've come face to face with ghosts, demons, haints, and other strange paranormal phenomena. All of it makes for a chilling good time. So grab yourself a sweet tea turn off the lights and listen to some eerie true ghost stories on homespun haints wherever you get your podcasts i'm not scared are you i actually i i engaged in a very brief relationship with a a a girl and she had discovered me on tiktok and then slid into my dms (gasps) on instagram because you can't message someone on tiktok and then and she herself is famous and she's like, I just think you're really hot, blah, blah, blah. And we carried on this relationship for like yeah. three weeks or whatever. But um, but it was very interesting. I was like, oh, there's some benefits to this mm-hmm. too. This is interesting. But also it's like when you're telling your story out there, then it's like I was at an event in Malibu a couple of weeks ago and they were, this girl comes up to me. I'm like looking for the restroom. She's like, are you Collier Landry? And like, I'm used to that now because of like the film right. or whatever, which is, I thought she was going to say, oh, listen to your podcast or I, I saw the film. But she's like, no, I'm your biggest fan on TikTok. And I was like, oh my God, this is like, this is actually a thing now. Okay, this is a thing. All right. I mean, that's cool. Mm -hmm. It just was like, oh, this is the thing. This is great. Um, I I, I can't imagine um, that. Yeah, it's funny. And the other thing I was thinking about, you just said you're at the McDonald's drive-thru. And I'm like, okay, that's terrible. But then you said to get your Diet Coke. And you cannot get fountain drinks because of COVID anywhere. I know. And I do love a, a good Diet Coke Diet occasionally Coke, yes. from the fountain with the ice. And now I'm like, you know what? I should just go to McDonald's and get it. That you, so you you gave me a pro tip right there. That's what I get at McDonald's is a, is a fountain Diet Coke. So like, that's all I wanted. I, 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 there's one down the street and I will at some point today go because yesterday I was like, I really want a fountain Diet Coke and I don't drink Diet Coke very often, but that's what I was craving. And I was like, I don't know where to go to get that. And now I do. It's just amazing. <laughs> like, I just want my Diet Coke. Fantastic. No, um, that's actually like my one vice is um, Coke and Diet Coke, which I, I limit myself on. Uh, I would rather have that than desserts. I don't like a lot of sweets or anything. So, But I love soda. I love Coke and I love Diet Coke. And I let myself have it once every couple of weeks if I'm having a very bad day. <laughs> but I'm like, Or I just want one. I'm like, you got to. And everybody's got. P- yeah. Pepsi now, and I'm like, what are you? What's wrong with you? This is like, so is gross. Pepsi this, okay? I'm like, no, no I want water. Like, I would rather rather have water than Pepsi. It's not worth it to me. Um, okay, so <laughs> yeah, now that we yeah. got that yeah. out of the way. Like, don't uh, say it, Coke, it's fine. <laughs> so, um, I guess what I was going to ask is, okay, so now you've you you've found this platform with yes. TikTok, you've arrived at this sort of place in your life. Like, what is? what is the sort of the next like evolution for you with your story? Are you going to write a book? Are you, are, I mean, have you been approached because of your TikTok because the story by like news organizations or I have been. production companies mm-hmm. or whatever? I have been. Yeah. So what does that um, look like? I chose with my family not to do that. Um, we were approached by someone um, like a, a news organization that, who wanted to do it. And, there were just too many um, red flags with it. So we uh, didn't go forward with that because I was like, I'd rather have more control over it than not. Um, But I don't know. I'd like to write a book about it eventually. I'm a big reader. I I try to read like... 
Well, yeah. I read all the time. So you said that. I have yeah. a library in my house. And today you're going to read yeah. 35 pages <laughs> and get halfway through chapter four of the new book that you're reading. I, the nonfiction right. book, because you have to read a nonfiction and a fiction book at the I'm, same time. I'm currently so reading four travel. books. <laughs> like, that is how I function. But I, I literally, like, I have a book goal for the year in general, but I'm actually three books away from hitting it for this year. So I might double it. I don't know yet. But um, yeah, I read a lot and I have a library in my house. Um, that I, So it's because cool. it, it's the only time I can really shut my brain off. It's kind of nice, but it's my thing. So I was like, I would love to write a book or something like that. But I just get daunted by like the idea of doing that. Um, oh, yeah. It's a lot. So I actually still have a ton of stuff to go through that I've not even read from this case. Like I have so many papers and so much evidence and stuff that I've not even seen because it's just, I ended up with two big totes full of stuff and like depositions and reports and all kinds of stuff, um, affidavits. And I was going to put more of it on TikTok. Um, and then it just kind of got too overwhelming so I took a break sure. for a couple months and yeah. I just posted about like my life. <laughs> and then um, I lost some followers for it, but I didn't really care because I have to do what's best for me. Oh, I lost, I lost followers too. I, I didn't post for like a month. They're like, oh, we didn't hear about your story. I mean, I see that and I'm mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, but like, I get it that it is entertainment for you, but mm -hmm. you know, also like I have to work. Right, right. <laughs> And also it's a lot for me and it, 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 it is, it is a lot to keep mm -hmm. doing this and keep giving your life up. And, you know, I think some people, some people are extra TikTok community is extremely, oh, supportive. Yeah. but then there are still people that are just mm -hmm. consumers that just want you just want to exploit it and just want to like no more, no more. It's like an insatiable, it's an, an insatiable yeah. appetite, a lot of ways, especially with yeah. true crime. And so they just want to hear more and more, more. And you're like, okay, well, that's all enough. <laughs> Like, I don't want to get to that part of the story yet because I'm also like, I have to deal with it. It's a whole thing. And yes, it's a three minute video, but that three minute video takes an hour for me to do it because I keep yeah. doing it or whatever. I, I do everything in one take. I, I do think too. you do as yeah. well. On I TikTok, do everything right? in one take. Yeah. I try to keep it. I don't do the jump cutty thing. I keep it all like just telling mm -hmm. the story. So I do want it to be, I, I do stop and restart a lot yeah. <laughs> and I go and I try to do it all in the app. I don't even try to like record it on my iPhone. Um, I just do it like right oh, there. I but... record mine in Snapchat. See, I don't use Snapchat. Yeah, I record mine in Snapchat because I can stop and start easier and like not have to worry about as choppy as it is. So I literally stop and start, save, stop, start, save. And then I literally upload it in that order and move on. I never look at it again. Interesting. Because I don't want to. Yeah, I literally record and but figuring out what I'm going to say takes me so long to figure out what I'm going to talk about how I'm going to approach it. I don't want to offend people. I don't want to offend people on TikTok. I don't want to offend people in my life. I don't want to, you know. And so it's kind of a fine line to be the face of something that so many people care about. Yeah, like it is. Like people don't realize that true crime has to be, like it is people's lives and it has to be glamorized to an extent to get people to care and to get interest for the case. But at the end of the day, it's not, a fan based thing it's people's lives like it's not yeah. something that like is for entertainment purposes only like we have to do this stuff to get attention for the victims yeah absolutely like absolutely. that's that's something um i've had to deal with a lot with people um in my real life like thinking that i'm doing this for attention and um I finally had to be like, yeah, I am. I am doing it for attention. I'm doing it for attention for her. Yeah, exactly. She deserves attention. It's been 25 years. That is exactly why I'm doing it. And I purposely film TikToks with no makeup, with my hair in a messy bun, with my pajamas on, because I want people to take me seriously and know like that's not the point. I am not the point. Yeah, it's the story. So, yeah. I think I saw you had a sleep apnea mask. Is that what that oh, was? Yeah. The, it's oh, a yeah. Mask? Oh, yeah. I was like, I'm not glamorous. Like, I am in general, but. Do you, but do you, so you, do you wear that to sleep? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's changed my life. It's the best thing I've ever done. That and sleeping pills. I love it. How do you, how do you sleep with that thing? <laughs> it's actually very comfortable once you get used to it. What does it do? Does it give you oxygen? Mm -hmm. or, yeah, or it's like forces oxygen because like I stop breathing in my sleep. 
and it, it forces me like it forces me to breathe wow. yeah i know it's incredible can you get that on amazon no <laughs> you have to have a prescription it's very expensive actually I'm sure, it, I'm sure it is. It looks very. Expensive. It's unfortunate. <laughs> I was like, it's uh, it's great to be like, yeah, I'm 32 and I sleep with the sleep apnea machine. It's great. Because people like you, me, uh, my good friend Tara Newell, who you, who said told me told me to tell you, said hi, <laughs> told her I said hi today, and I love her so much. Um, she wanted to make sure to, for me to That's tell sweet. you that. And her and I are doing a podcast together, which I I'd love to have you on Survivor Squad. Sure. But um, we are uh. You know, it, it, like we're all telling our Kara Robinson Chamberlain, mm-hmm. same, uh, same thing. Like we're all sharing these stories because we're in this sort of unique position where there are many people that cannot talk right. about this. And, um, and we are able and to articulate and to show that we live good, fulfilling lives and this isn't controlling us gives a lot of people hope. So it's almost like it becomes this mission for us that we're like, okay, we've got to continue doing this because it's, it's so important. The work is so important. Right. And it does give people hope because I don't know about you, but I'm sure, I mean, with me, with what, even when I made the film, right. It's, you know, I set out to change one person's life and, 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 you know, and heal my own. And it was like tens of thousands of people that, that, that I, that I yeah. know of, like not even the, the, forget the people that don't reach out that this affects. And then with TikTok and the people that come forward that you give me strength, you give me hope, this, that, and the other, which is incredible to be able to do that mm-hmm. stuff for people. But it is very taxing. It is very exhausting. Yeah. You are reliving a lot of it. And sometimes if you don't keep yourself in check, you go mm-hmm. you crash and burn. Yeah, totally. You know? And I know that when I first blew up, um, I was getting over a hundred messages a day of people telling me the worst things that have ever happened to them. And it was so hard because I wanted to be there for everybody, but I felt so much pressure like from everyone around me and then from TikTok. And like, I had to like step back for like a couple weeks and then start responding to people because I couldn't function for a while. And I was like, I need to do this at a slower pace that works for me because I don't want to break down. Yeah. And it, and it, and it is. And they also, people have to understand is that, you know, when you're doing this, like I, I am a, am a, an artist and, and I, I have to work and, and like, I have to make films and I have yeah. to do stuff. And, and I also have to get paid for my content. Like I just started doing ads mm-hmm. on my TikTok, Right. Because I did brand partnerships and, and I think people were like, Oh, I didn't like my friend came over yesterday. Who was a big TikToker? I was like 150,000 followers. And she's like, I want to talk to you about this video. And I was like, the the video that it says hashtag on it, yeah. <laughs> on it like to start it because that's what it says and it says paid partnership is that the video you want to talk about she's like oh i didn't see that i was like well yeah i was like that's why i'm talking yeah. about it yeah. on there i'm not like actually like this is and i'm relating it to my story and my my brand and that's yeah. what you do she's like oh i didn't know you were doing that i yeah. was like well yeah and it, but it's like i do th- things have to feed yes. the machine to keep yes. the machine going you have to you know you have to not only you know disengage so you can process everything but also and and be a better content creator in the process and not let it die out i mean even the podcast is like you know getting monetization or getting people to right. get on the patreon it's like it, this this is a very expensive endeavor in terms of finances and time and everything and it's a full-time job that pays nothing right so you're doing these things and you're trying to share but also you need to keep the ship afloat yeah. if they want to keep having mm-hmm. the content it's like if you don't want the content then i'll answer your things all day but it, it does it gets exhausting and then you and then you hear these stories yeah, that are so they're heartbreaking horrible. too and how they're struggling you know i i would say most of the ones that i encounter probably you too just because it's it's just a, it is an mm-hmm. epidemic is you know domestic Completely. violence and and yep. sexual assault you know sexual assault as a child all of this and it's heartbreaking and of course a lot of them are like you know, I turned to drugs, I turned mm-hmm. to alcohol, I turned to everything. I did I turned to prostitution because I'm worthless, bad relationships, bad marriage, because that's yeah. all I'm worth. And then it's, they see these stories and they go, but you give me hope. Or when I read my father's letters from prison and expose like the narcissism and the gaslighting and everything, they go, oh, well, this is okay. Uh, well, this was my ex-husband or this is my ex-boyfriend that I broke up with two weeks ago. And now I'm not going back yeah. to him. Somebody wrote that on the TikTok and people were like, you go girl. Get rid of that man. See, this is what it is. And it's like, that's awesome 
to like expose this that people can change their lives because it's like then it makes me feel like well I, my mother didn't vi die in vain and i didn't i'm doing something worthwhile that at least is helping people because people go well how can you read these letters and you're revisiting your trauma and that's a lot and and it seems like you're not over it, it was like no i am over it but it still oh, yeah, affects me of course. like just because you're just because you've forgiven yeah. and you're healing from it doesn't mean that that's still not a process and when you rediscover and reread those letters that were sent to you as a child realizing that this is a man who murdered this child's mother and then is gaslighting him about his mother and about the murder and trying to make him feel guilty for his testimony like that's sinister and it upsets me now because i'm looking at it objectively not as myself but as as yeah. a guy who's reading a letter that a father wrote you know and this all started because we you know we showed the letters in in my film right but it but the information that people glean off this is invaluable to them so people were like well why do you do that i'm like because because people are taking it and they're running with it and they're and they're recognizing these behaviors in their own life and it's changing their lives oh, yeah. it's incredible i've had a lot of people that are in situations or just left situations that they were like this could have been me this could have been me and i'm like i yeah it's helpful yep. and i'm i mean i'm an analytical chemistry engineer that's what i do i i don't know i came into this world completely out of it i had no idea how to do anything i was like okay I guess I'll figure it out, but it's gonna it's gonna be a learning curve. I'm gonna need some time. Um, this is not what I do. So like, um, but I've had a lot of people be super supportive about it. Um, but there are certain things that I wish I knew how to do because it is very expensive to do this. Like, and it yeah. does take yes, all of is. my time. It takes so much of my time yeah. and like feeding that. And I'm like, okay, I need to figure out how to monetize this in a way that doesn't like alienate people, you know, like that are following yeah. me and like they feel supported still. Um, but that's, that's, and I think that, but I think at the end of the day, they want you to be supported. Yeah. They're like, okay, well, if you can, if you can get a paid partnership with someone, we don't necessarily, we, we might find this brand very valuable, which these people wrote to me and they're like, this is a great thing. This yeah. is super cool. And then some people are like, oh, well, why are you doing this? Or well, I'll follow you. But it's like, you, I do have to do things that sustain mm -hmm. this because it's like, it is so much work. And if you, if it's what you're doing, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, what the paradox of choice, I guess, or, or not, not the paradox of choice. <laughs> that's the wrong word. It's a, it's just a cha It's just yeah. a challenge is what it is to really balance all of this and live your life too and also keep yourself sane and keep your mental health up and all of those things and i'm um, sorry i commend you on that now so it's really fast you said people supporting you now you told me when we first spoke that your you did have family members that came to you and were like you should oh do yes this. oh yes? yes my whole mom's family is like on it and they kind of put it on you they kind of put it on you um not intentionally they were just really excited. Of course not. So they yeah. were like, oh, you should do a video about this thing. Or, you know, you should mention this. Or you should mention this. And finally, um, I did have like a come to Jesus moment with them. And I was just like, hey, um, I need a break. Yeah. Um, I would love to do that. We need to not talk about it for a couple days. Like, you know, because it was just, I yeah. was like, this is becoming my whole life. I can't even go to dinner without being bombarded. But it was, they were just so excited you know that and so it was kind of hard for me to even say anything you know and create that little bit of a boundary because i was like oh they're so pumped you know that somebody's paying attention and that people care and they've spent 25 years trying to advocate you know for their sister and their sister-in-law and their aunt and like nobody cared nobody listened to them and so finally people are listening and they're just elated about it and so they wanted to feed the machine you know they were like Oh, do a TikTok on this, or you need to do one on this. And now that I'm like, now I'm like months later. Okay, what should I do one on, guys? Like, I don't know. Like, what, help right. me come up with stuff. But like, right at the that point in time, I'd actually just moved and just started a new job, and so, like it was all at once. And I was like, uh, give me, give me a second. And now I'm much better with it. But they they meant they meant well, but it was very very hard to deal with. But that's good. I mean, like, it is good to feel yeah. that support, right? It's not like, you know, I think it would be different if they reached out like, what are you doing? Oh, uh, I know. It's good. That's a nice, that's a nice feeling, especially having from your mother's family. My mother's family, they don't even understand why those that do talk to me in my mother's family are talking to me. Like, why are you talking to him? It's like, I, I, I didn't, I would think I would be the celebrated yeah. one because I, I didn't 
my, let my father get away with it. He mm-hmm. would have gotten away with it. You know, it was because yeah. of me that he got arrested and he went to prison because I testified because again, it was all circumstantial evidence. It wasn't, mm-hmm. there wasn't anything to really pin him to anything. And it was my testimony that ultimately sealed his fate. Right. So it's like, how can you yeah. vilify me for doing that? And how can you vilify me for sharing my story? It's my story to share. Mm-hmm. You didn't lose your mother. You didn't like, you know, it's, it's what I have to say to these people, but it's, it's look, you know, survivor shaming and all these things. And then, and then the massive consumption of true crime and the way it is, yeah. the frenzy, it's all, it's all, it's all a big pot that's being stirred and it's sort of working itself out. I just did an article with Buzzfeed about, you know, ethical true crime and, yeah. you know, it, it's interesting because now people are really thinking about that. Like, Oh, my favorite whatever is that person's worst mm-hmm. day of their life, mm-hmm. you know, and people are really starting to think about that and how they consume true crime, which is yeah. amazing. It's amazing that survivors are being looked at in a different way. Whereas before, and especially with like SA and, and DV and things like that, where people are, you know, almost excoriated or shamed because of what they went through or feel that shame because it's a societal thing and they couldn't come forward. And um, that's not fair. Like that's no. not, like that's not there. They have nothing to be ashamed of. Like it's it, you know it, it's sad that they feel that way. And I always try to you know help break down those walls and those stigmas. And I and I think I think that's what we're both yeah. doing, anyways. Um, I do want to do. I'm gonna turn the monitor on. I do want to do a little um, video for TikTok of both of us okay. on here. I think it would be kind of yeah, cool of course. Okay with that. Oh, that's a photo. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> So I'm here with Brooke Nicole, or I'm, I'm here with uh, some of you guys might recognize on TikTok. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello. That is Brooke Nicole. And I, I think I'm doing this right. There, Can you see me? Go. Okay. Yeah. The, the iPhone's sort of functioning. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, yeah, it's focusing. Um, anyways, we are interviewing on Moving Past Murder. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. We are doing a little interview for Moving Past Murder. And uh, what's up, TikTok? How are you? And um, woo-hoo. love you guys. We will see you guys very soon. We love you. And uh, you know, there hey. you are. Go for it. Very excited. Hey. Very excited. <laughs> My God, that was terrible. It's fine. It'll be fine. It's fine. It'll be fine. Um, this has been really fun. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. So much. And now I need to know. Now I know where to get my Diet Coke with my yes, ice from yes. the fountain. Super important. Super easy. You're welcome. It's a great <laughs> thing. Uh, Brooke, Brooke, uh, Brooke Nicole, Brooklyn yeah. as you, is your real name. Yep. And um, it's so funny. I was telling my producer, I was like, I'm interviewing Brooklyn. And she goes, Who, who's that? I was like, well, she goes by Brooke Nicole. She's like, oh, her real name is Brooklyn. I was like, yes, yep. that's her real name. Yep. Brooklyn. It's Brooklyn. Brooklyn, Brooklyn, <laughs> let me in. What is that? Uh, who's saying that? <laughs> Ava, the Ava brothers, Ava brothers. Yes, yes. Brooklyn, yep, Brooklyn, yep. Let me in. Yeah, you see the state I'm in? Yep. Yeah, yeah. He was just singing that to me in college. <laughs> Aww, that's, cute. that's very sweet. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time. This is good stuff, and yeah, we're all part of this family now. It's very cool. It's cute. It's cute. I like it. <laughs> it's a supportive family. We're all here for each other. Yeah, it's nice. That's heavy stuff, right? Um. But it is really amazing to also hear Brooke's, you know, positivity in her voice and her optimism is honestly as someone who is a perpetual optimist his entire life, because really, and I know a lot of people come at me (laughs) on social media, uh, you know, wondering like, well, well, how can you be so positive or your father did murder your mother and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you just kind of one day you got to make a choice and you got to do something about it. And, you know, there are many people that are and more and more so in the podcast space are really taking action for their loved ones who have been missing or are also, um, you know, uh, really, uh, I don't know, really speaking up for ethical true crime, I suppose would be what they're doing. And in fact, I was just in Buzzfeed last Friday, August 12th. Um, uh, they did an article about ethical true crime, most mostly focused on the show, the thing about Pam, which stars Renee Zellweger. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it is a very tragic story about just deception, betrayal, and just uh, a horrific, a horrific crime um, that was per- perpetrated on multiple people. Um, 
And my good friends over at Minds of Madness actually did an episode with Russ Faria, actually two-parter episode with Russ Faria. And you can check out their podcast. You can also check me out on their podcast, Minds of Madness, uh, coming up because I am in an upcoming episode. I believe the episode is tentatively titled The Brass Ring. But, uh, and I'll talk more about that uh, as well as that episode air date approaches. So um, I wanna thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, again, thank you for all your listener comments and feedback. I really appreciate it. It helps me grow this show into something that is really speaking to you guys, my audience. And uh, so on that note, I am Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. Please Subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. The film A Murder in Mansfield is available on Investigation Discovery, Discovery Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio in association with RSA Entertainment. Please visit mpmpodcast.com to show your support today.